And joining us now here in studio, Brian Evans. He is Associate Professor in the Department of Politics and Public Administration at Ryerson University. Brian, it's nice to have you back here at TVO. Thank you. Let's just set up this first question with a bit of background here. We're going to go back to 2008. Mm -hmm. The Great Recession hits. Mm -hmm. Governments all over the world decide they need to prime the pump lest uh, unemployment rates go through the roof, and so they decide to spend, spend, spend. Right. We are now a few years later, and governments in their wisdom have decided it is time to retrench. Yeah. We're in times of austerity. We've got to stop spending, and they've got to figure out who bears the brunt of all of that. Correct. How difficult is it to figure out who should be on that list? <laughs> it's a very good question. Uh, very difficult if you're an incumbent government. Uh, however, I think we need to go back and look what were the conditions that brought us here. And we have to remember a speculative housing boom or crisis in America migrated into Wall Street, blew up in Wall Street, and then spread around the world, and here we are. Mm -hmm. And how did that speculative boom that really imploded or exploded on Wall Street become a public sector problem? It's pure, pure politics. Period, full stop? Yeah. Pure, uh, why pure politics? Well, it's really amazing. How did a, a speculative boom that began in one part of the economy then migrate globally and then become a political problem where the public sector everywhere, we can talk about extremes like in Greece or Ireland or Britain, Italy, Portugal, America, and now Ontario, but everywhere, same phenomenon where it became a public sector problem. So you're saying it's, it's, it originated in the private sector, the private sector should have been responsible for feeling the pain to solve it, sure. but instead it's the public sector that's being asked to. Is that, Completely, is that what you're here saying? and everywhere. Hmm. Okay, well let's, the Globe and Mail editorialized about this point. Let me read a little excerpt of that and we'll go on from there. It would be wrong to call the government brave in any of this, the Globe says. Economically and politically, the Liberals had little maneuvering room. They had waited as long as they could, but there is no roar of economic growth in the distance. Only 2% growth as far as the eye can see. Ontario would have gone over the edge if the Premier had continued making nice with the unions, and progressive conservative leader Tim Hudak would have eaten them for breakfast. So, I appreciate your point, which is this is a private sector created problem. The private sector should have had to resolve it. But the government has decided, in its wisdom, that the public sector is going to have to be part of the solution as well. And the Liberals have apparently said, teachers, doctors, healthcare workers, public servants, you're going to have to help us fix this. Was there any other choice to be made? Sure. And that can definitely be part of the equation in terms of moving forward and moving out of the situation we're in. Uh, the, the, the public sector, public sector workers, I think would be more than happy, largely, to participate in that. However, what has been left out of the entire discussion, the conversation uh, from Drummond forward is the revenue side. What about taxation? What about a taxation? Thank you for calling it taxation. Most people just talk about revenues or revenue enhancements. What they mean is tax increases. Yes. So let's call it what it is, yeah, right? No, okay. No, we have to be, I think we need to be transparent. Word of the day, transparent. And, you know, uh, I've looked at different studies that look, look at or propose uh, a modest 2% increase on the top rate for people earning over a quarter million a year. Over a quarter million a year. Apparently, that alone, and that's very, very modest, would bring in a quarter billion to half a billion in additional revenue alone. That little measure alone. So why didn't they do it? Uh, again, politics. Okay, politics means they may, I mean, polit uh, to govern is to choose. So they Correct. chose. Yeah. Why did they choose not to go over the top, go after the top one or two percent of income earners, and rather go after the broad swath of people? Well, I think that that, that can be a very complicated question. Uh, a key part of it being uh, those are people who are politically engaged, who know how to work the the, the levers of, of of political life and government. Uh, they are people who are influential in the upper policy uh, centers of government, both provincially, nationally, and internationally. Yeah, but Brian, there's not very many of them. No, there aren't. And there's 120,000 teachers out there who That's are right. a lot more politically active and can, and, and can bring down a government, as we have seen in the past. And we have. So it raises the question again, why go after teachers and doctors who, you know, who, who have pretty good reputations and, are, and can be pretty politically active, yeah. as opposed to this top 1%, well, who nobody's got any sympathy for, let's face it. Uh, and, and you're quite correct on that point, too. Uh, however, we have to be careful here. Every budget, not just this budget, every budget, everywhere, 
is fundamentally a political document. Mm -hmm. And how they have constructed that particular component of the budget that came down yesterday is they've deferred those issues of taking on the teachers and doctors into the future. That won't be part of the budget bill. That's part mm -hmm. of a future negotiation. No, not, not in the far future, but there may be plenty of opportunities to make different arrangements, make different deals with one group or another. My prediction would be there will be uh, uh, deals that are struck with one part, maybe not every part of the public sector, but particular compo important component parts like the doctors and move them off the table. Okay, governments have choices, opposition parties have choices. Mm -hmm. The Conservatives decided right out of the gate they're going to vote against this budget and Tim Hudak, the opposition leader, said every one of my members is going to show up to vote it down. Nobody's going to get the 24-hour flu mm -hmm. so the government can sk skate on this. Yeah. Did he have any other choice besides the choice he made? For him, no. Uh, from, from the election forward, uh, he drew the line uh, about public sector expenditure around Drummond when the Drummond report was tabled. Uh, he said if he were Premier, he would implement all of it. Uh, it would be awfully hard for him to begin retreating from that. He drew the line very firmly and clearly. Uh, now we have to turn to the NDP and Andrea Horvath. Uh, they have been given a bone or two in the budget. Uh, that they are, you know, chomping over right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the NDP have said they're going to talk to the electorate, talk to their membership about what they should do. And at the end of the day, I believe they're going to come forward and vote for the budget based on the uh, holiday for the corporate tax decrease and the curbing of uh, chief executive compensation. Yeah, but that was pretty... What the, what the Liberals did on, on uh, executive compensation at hospitals and agencies and so on was really pretty minor league compared to what the NDP wanted. And you still think they'll vote for the budget? Well, again, uh, I think uh, uh, Premier McGuinty and Dwight Duncan only today have opened that door a bit more. They've opened a door to further consultation, further negotiation with the NDP. They may widen a bit more. And I'm a former uh, bureaucrat myself. I, I did work in, in the uh, Ontario Ministry of Labour at one time. And I know that very often uh, different deals can be made that may not have to do with the budget itself. It might have to do with labour legislation, dealing with uh, uh, precarity in work. It might have to do with uh, public pensions. It may have to do with a whole bunch of things that weren't directly talked about in the budget. There is... Um this may be a prejudice in media or a prejudice in certain parts of society, but, but I hear it all the time. Conservatives love to cut liberals. It's just not part of their DNA to do it. Mm. How difficult would it have been for the McGuinty government to bring down yesterday's budget? Um, I believe hugely difficult. Uh, we got to think back to 2003. They were elected on not being the common sense revolution. Yesterday, we got a hint of the common sense revolution part two. And you can well imagine that there are people, the Liberal Party is a very, you know, everywhere you look at Liberal Party, Centre parties, they're a combination of, you know, lean a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. Uh, and you have people in that caucus who would be horribly uncomfortable with yesterday. And, and, and you know it, we all know it. Uh, but the, the, the dominant thinking in the party clearly went in one direction. Liberals like to spend, right? That is generally what they get into government to do. Well, when they can. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there was an awful lot of damage to be repaired after, after 2003, and, and they began doing that. Uh, what they failed to do, they failed to deal with the structural deficit left behind by the common sense revolution. You know, worth anywhere from 5 to $15 billion per year in revenue that they don't have. Uh, the American political journalist Thomas Edsel recently wrote in the New York Times, the politics of austerity are inherently favorable to conservatives and inhospitable to liberals. Mm. You agree? Um, it would depend. Uh, and it would depend in the following way. I read a poll, uh, a Canadian poll, not an Ontario poll, but I, I think we can extrapolate and make a, a generalization about Ontario or anywhere, uh, where, yeah, the majority of Canadians wanted public sector or, or, or public expenditures cut, I think by uh, 53, 54%. But you went a, a bit further down the survey and you found that a majority, 65%, favored more public expenditure in health care, education, and employment programs. And There's a bit of a contradiction in that. Yeah, so, but this government can read polls. Yeah. So they, are they thinking as long as we protect health and education, we can do some slash and burn elsewhere? That clearly would be part of it. Uh, hmm. But the reality being, uh, the type of budget they brought down, if we project forward, I, I don't know if I want to call it slashing and burning, but they are cutting health and education, in effect, over the long term. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me ask you this, because you're, you're a public servant, you're paid by the public purse, yes? Mm -hmm. So are teachers, doctors, public servants, university professors, uh, college instructors, are they more likely to be open to 
budget cuts in an age of austerity? Uh, again, it would depend, and, and for me, the key thing being the taxation expenditure side. I think many people would be prepared to uh, uh, pay their fair share. I would as an individual, you probably would. However, we want it to be our fair share, and we don't want the millionaire down the road, the banker down the road, the investment banker down the road, making 10 times more than we do, paying nothing at all. Is that part of what went into means testing drugs? Oh, I think part of it. Uh, but again, you know, uh, uh, Dwight Duncan characterized it as a balanced liberal approach. The reality being one little thing. Why don't we look at uh, people collecting welfare, the Ontario Child Benefit, all frozen, all put on hold. You know, the bottom 5% of our province are being put on hold. They're getting by on very little to begin with. And yet, that modest, modest tax measure that I propose for people uh, earning over a quarter million a year, that would have more than paid to help people at the bottom 5% maintain, in fact, move ahead a little bit. Hmm. Uh, let's talk about uh, growth rates, because, of course, there was a time in this province when growth was 5, 6, 7% a year. Yeah. I'm talking 30, 40 years ago yeah. now, 40 years ago. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you wanted to try to balance your books, uh, buoyant revenues would help you do that because the economy was chugging along very nicely. Uh, we saw the estimates in the budget yesterday. Uh, growth rates below 2% for last year, this year, might get over 2% next year, the year after. How do you govern, in particular, how does a liberal govern without buoyant growth rates? Uh, not only liberal, any government. You know, uh, We make a big deal of the common sense revolution. If you go back and look at the numbers, by 1999, even under Premier Mike Harris, they were pouring money back into healthcare, back into education. You know, not, not to the degree that they had taken it out, but they were beginning to put money back in. Money was beginning to come back in, uh, largely because of the American uh, economic boom at the time, how times have changed. Uh, but so for any government, it would be difficult. But yeah, the reality being, when you have money coming in, uh, you, you, you can invest in programs, you can create new programs, you have much, much more room to create a, a, a broad political coalition, you know, to be the one Ontario that Dalton McGuinty likes to talk mm -hmm. about. One of the things that the Premier always thinks he does a pretty good job at is conveying a sense of optimism about the province's future. Sure. How do you convey a sense of optimism in an age of austerity? <laughs> How you can do it? I, I think there were a couple of things that the current government could have done. Again, we have to remember it's a subnational government, a provincial government. There are a lot of real constraints that limit what they can do. Uh, e even the national government would have difficulty. But by being, I think, a little bit more long-term thinking, we have anemic growth. You're, you're quite correct. But we have growth. We're not going backward. It's not flat sure. line. No, it's not a recession. It's not negative. Right. It's growth. Mm -hmm. And by taking the long-term view, uh, and notwithstanding the Drummond report, which was based on a lot of assumptions that could they come true? Yeah, but highly unlikely. And therefore, it, it drew a very negative uh, uh, f uh, picture of the future where we would have a $30 billion a year annual deficit. Mm -hmm. It could happen, but everything, everything in life would have to go wrong. Yeah. Everything. Uh, of course, the thinking behind that is you've got to scare the you-know-what out of people before they're open to you know, measures like these. Yeah, but then, then feeding into the negative thinking, and we all begin worrying about the medium to long-term future. Uh, and it's all already well, well entrenched. Uh, another poll I read uh, saw a majority of Canadians feel the next 25 years are going to be god awful, mm. and 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 you know we have this negative kind of, of, of a zeitgeist kind of taking hold of the population as a whole. Brian, last 30 seconds. Do governments, as a general rule, survive when they have to govern during an age of austerity? Uh, again, it would all depend on how they govern. Uh, we've had a lot of talk uh, today about will the government survive a budget vote. Um, I think they will, but why don't we imagine they do not? Um, my own view would be if they had to go to an election, they'd probably win a majority. <laughs> That's probably what they're thinking too. I think so. Brian Evans, Ryerson University, thanks for coming in tonight. Thank you for having me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.